Hello, my name is Charlie Huang, and I've been working on the Sea of Erie project with my partners, Marcus Rohr and Ross Monster. Alongside my two teammates, we've been lucky enough to work with our mentor, Jason Malone, who has provided us with great insight and input on the topic of HIV and AIDS. We've also had the pleasure of working with our three Kenyan partners, Nicholas, Benson, and Edward. Through this partnership, we've been able to su successfully identify concerns within the community of Viria. Kenya, and also come up with effective solutions. Before addressing the ethical and scientific issues behind HIV and AIDS, one must understand the life cycle and anatomy of the virus. The capsid, at the core of the virus, contains the necessary enzymes for viral replication, most notably integrase and reverse transcriptase. Also inside the capsid is the nucleocapsid, which contains the viral RNA itself. On the surface of the virus lies GP120, the surface protein necessary for the fusion of the cell membranes between the T cell and the virus itself. The virus enters the body through three main methods. The first method of transfer, unprotected sex with an infected partner, is the most common of the three. Secondly, sharing sharp objects with an infected partner, most often through drug use or sharing of razors and other similar objects, can often lead to the transfer of the disease. Because the two most common methods of HIV transmission tend to be associated with poor or immoral behavior, the stigma surrounding HIV and infected victims is quite common in certain countries and seemingly impossible to overcome. The third and least common method of transmission is vertical transmission, or transmission through breastfeeding or childbirth. Through modern medicine, however, this can be easily prevented. Once in the bloodstream, the virus targets T cells, recognizing them by their CD4 surface proteins. Once identified, the HIV virus binds its GP120 surface protein with the CD4 of the host cell and merges the cell membranes together, injecting the contents of the virus into the victim's cell. Once the capsid enters the T cell, it releases the viral RNA and necessary enzymes into the cell. After this, reverse transcriptase, one of the enzymes from the original HIV virus, reverse transcribes the single-stranded viral RNA into double-stranded viral DNA. Once this process completes, the newly formed DNA enters the host nucleus. Once inside, the enzyme integrase splices the viral DNA into the DNA of the cell, creating a provirus. After this has been completed, the virus can now use the host cell to begin replication of copies of the disease. Once the provirus is created, the production of new viruses inside the cell begins. Once the host cell dies after already having produced a large number of new viruses, they are released back into the bloodstream in search of new targets. At first, the body's immune system limits the number of HIV in the bloodstream to a relatively small number. However, due to the high rate of mutation during reverse transcription, it is unable to kill them all. In addition, the immune system cannot detect the virus while it lies dormant in a host cell. At this stage, HIV goes into a long period of dormancy, often lasting for three to six months before beginning production of the virus again. After many years of the virus slowly lowering the infected person's CD4 count, the HIV virus develops into AIDS itself. Finding a safe and reliable vaccine for HIV is currently a significant goal for the scientific community. HIV damages the immune system needed for an effective vaccine. This is one of the reasons why it is so difficult to manufacture a truly effective cure. Another issue is that the virus converts its genetic material from RNA to DNA. This makes it nearly impossible for a vaccine to work correctly. Vaccines created for other diseases such as polio are designed to target specific proteins in the viruses to eventually kill them. However, this method will not work for HIV because of the structure and shape of the virus. AIDS is a widespread global disease that exists in many parts of the world. In Russia, there is a prevalent amount of drug use that continues to dominate the landscape. In Thailand, it's a prostitution ring that manages to spread disease wildly. In Sub-Saharan Africa, there is a limited amount of sex education and medical help offered. The people of these regions also tend to have negative perspectives on the topic of HIV, which often leads to shunning and often exile among people. Because of the problems surrounding the creation of an HIV-AIDS vaccine, spreading AIDS awareness is an extremely pressing matter. 
the effects of these awareness programs alone can be enough to drastically lower the infection rates. 23 of the 25 nations with the highest infection rates are all located in Africa. By this alone, the importance of AIDS awareness programs becomes obvious. Our BioExpo group has worked for hours on, on end during the past few months to research and discover the social and cultural impacts of the disease, not only in the region of Viria, Kenya, but all throughout the world. We've come to find that HIV impacts a great amount of people. Because of this, we aim to spread information regarding the protection of ourselves against this devastating disease. The stigmas that unsafe sex is acceptable within the adult community in certain places in the world are unacceptable, especially in areas where HIV is so prevalent. The social standards of these people prove time and time again that HIV is frowned upon. So once someone contracts it, they're automatically shunned by those who are associated with them. One can look to Brazil to the impact of AIDS awareness efforts. Once considered amongst the highest infection rates in the modernized world, the government focused on spreading awareness as well as offering free protection and medication to all citizens. By giving away free condoms and spreading awareness of the disease itself as well as how to protect against the disease grew by just doing this, even without the aid of a full-fledged prevention system. This is a prime example of how we can make positive change in the world with small steps leading into big improvements.